Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie at Hayek and I'd like to welcome you all to another webinar part of the CAGS webinar series. This webinar series is organized by the Center for Arab Genomic Studies. Sorry. This webinar is uh, organized by the Center for Arab Genomic Studies, which is a division of the Sheikh Hamdan Award for Medical Sciences. And the award was established in 1999 under the patronage of the late Sheikh Hamdan bin Rashid Al Maktoum, may he rest in peace. And since he passed away last year, uh, the award has continued its many activities um, in guidance by his uh, vision. The CAGS webinar series started in 2021, and we saw many excellent uh, talks by uh, local, regional, and international speakers um, on topics on various topics related to the field of human genetics and genomics. And we have been lucky to have had the, uh, the support of uh, the Dubai Health Authority, the Ministry of Health and Prevention, the Emirates Medical Association, as well as the Emirates Health um, uh, Services. Um, this particular webinar is uh, sponsored by Sanofi, and the topic for today is lysosomal storage disorders, and we have two great talks uh, lined up for you. But before we get to the interesting part, I would like to just go over uh, some housekeeping rules. If you have questions for our speakers, please write them down in the Q&A box. We will try to answer as many as we can uh, right after the second uh, talk when we'll have the Q&A session. Your CME certificates can be downloaded as of tomorrow. Uh, please follow the link uh, which you see on the screen and we'll also uh, put it in the chat. Um, at the end of the webinar, a short survey will pop, on, pop up on your screen. So please answer them, uh, answer the questions because we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, and now on to our first speaker. Our first speaker for today is Professor Hussein Onay. He is a professor of medical genetics uh, he's also the founder of Multigen, and then that's a um, um, biotech company that uh, provides diagnostic uh, testing kits, as uh, it also provides uh, genetic testing for diagnosis. He is also the co-founder of uh, Gene2Info, which provides end-to-end uh, -end, uh, innovative solution to genetic screening. Uh, his talk today will give uh, an overview of lysosomal storage disorders, and he'll also focus on a few subtypes uh, like Fabry, Pompey, MSP type 1, and others. Uh, Professor Hussein, it's very nice to have you here, and over to you. Um, thank you very much. It is a great honor for me to be here today, and, and now I am uh, sharing my presentation. Okay, um, today I will talk about the genetic basis of lysosomal storage disease, and I will try to explain this uh, topic uh, with the help of uh, four uh, different lysosomal storage diseases. And um, lysosomal storage diseases are a group of uh, metabolic genetic disorders, and there are uh, more than 70 different uh, genetic disorders in this group that uh, affect the function of uh, lysosomes, and um, most of them are inherited in autosomal recessive way, and just three of them are inherited uh, in X-linked pattern. And these are the groups of lysosomal storage diseases. Uh, the classifications might change um, from paper to paper, but these are the main lysosomal storage disease group. And before um, going into the details of the disease, uh, what we are doing in order to detect the uh, mutations in this genes, we are performing, of course, sequencing, and nearly in all cases, we are performing next generation sequencing, single gene analysis, or panel sequencing, but we rarely use Sanger sequencing in especially the genetic emergencies such as infantile onset Pompe disease or um, adenosine deaminase deficiency, because in those cases, we want to give the result in, in a single day. And we have a complementary method here. It, it is MLPA. In some selected cases, we are performing MLPA for these lysosomal storage disorders. For example, in uh, female fabric cases, uh, if we have clinical signs and symptoms of the disease, uh, we are uh, performing MLPA analysis. 
And I want to begin with MS uh, mucopal sacchardosis type 1. This is the classical uh, uh, MPS type, and it was uh, it is seen in 1 in 100,000, and the responsible gene is IDUA gene, and the inherited pat inheritance pattern is autosomal recessive inheritance, and um, there are uh, more than 300 different variants uh, have been described up to now. In MPS type 1, we are expecting to have coarse facial features, um, frequent upper respiratory tract infections, hernias, hepatosplenomegaly, joint deformities, disastrosis multiplex, corneal clouding, and of course, developmental delays and regression. And we have some clinical subtypes of the disease. Hurler uh, type is the most severe phenotype in this MPS uh, type 1. Hurler shy is intermediate phenotype, and shy is the milder phenotype of the disease. We are always seeing um, this phenotype classification, this severity classification in nearly every metabolic disorder. And how about genotype phenotype correlation in MPS type 1? In most of the families, there are unique mutations, uh, but we have two frequent uh, nonsense variants. These two variants are especially prevalent in Europe. And then novel mutation detection rate is relatively high in MPS type 1. And this is one of the uh, biggest cohort published in um, 2019. And as we as expected, um, in especially severe cases, we have nonsense variants. And as expected, as atten in attenuated cases, most of the uh, variants are missense variants. And as you see, most of the uh, variants are distributed all, are all, uh, all coding exons, and we can easily classify the variants um, as severe or uh, for attenuated form. And the interesting side about the distribution of the mutation is in nearly every country, the mutation spectrum is highly different. As you see in Turkey, uh, these two common nonsense variants are just responsible for the nearly 15% of the cases. But in Poland, it is nearly uh, as high as 65% of all cases. And this table summarizes the type of the mutations that we have in severe and attenuated forms. In severe forms, we have especially nonsense mutations, and these two mutations are the most common mutations that we see in the hurler type. And in the uh, attenuated form, in hurler shy and shy, we are seeing missense variants, and these two variants are the most prevalent missense variants that we see in MPS type 1. The interesting point here is same combination, same homozygous variant can cause um, attenuated form in some cases and some, uh, it, it may cause a severe phenotype in some cases. And this indicates that there must be some modifier genes or uh, modifier factors in MPS type 1. And second disease is Gaucher disease. It is one of the uh, most commonly seen sphingolipidosis type, and it is seen in one in 50,000 or one in um, to one in 100,000. The responsible gene is GBA gene. It is also autosomal recessively inherited genetic disorder, and more than 500 different genetic variants um, have been described up to now. And we have uh, five clinical subtypes in Gaucher disease. Type 1 is important because in type 1 we do not have a central nervous system involved and this type is um, mainly benefiting from uh, enzyme, repl uh, enzyme replacement therapy and the main characteristic of type 1 is bone lesions and hepatosplenomegaly and cytopenia especially thrombocytopenia uh, type 2 and type 3 are neuropathic Gaucher types. Type 2 is more severe form of the disease. We have uh, severe uh, central nervous system involvement in type 2 cases. And type 3 cases are uh, supercut juvenile, has uh, supercut juvenile phenotype. This perinatal 
lethal form is the uh, most severe type of Pompe. And the important thing here is if you see a non-immune hydrops fatalis in a prenatal ultrasound, ultrasound image, you may think that it might be a Gaucher disease. And it is an ultra rare cardiovascular form. Only one uh, specific variant can cause this uh, cardiovascular form. And we have some specific uh, and common variants in, uh, uh, in Gaucher disease. And what we see here is we have a very um, highly homologous pseudogene in uh, Gaucher disease. And this causes a problem in the diagnosis, of course. And this uh, very um, similar and very um, near pseudogene can cause crossover problem or recombination in this area. And how is genotype phenotype correlation in Gaucher disease? Uh, this is the most common uh, mutation that we see in type one disease. This is related to type one and this variant prevents from neurologic disease and homozygous cases are milder then compound heterozygous cases, we can even see asymptomatic homozygous cases with this variant, and these cases must be followed up. And this is the classical variant that we see in neuropathic Gaucher. It causes very low enzyme level, and it is related to neuropathic Gaucher. It can cause type 2 or type 3 disease. But some carriers do not develop neuropathic Gaucher, and it again reminds us that there might be some, um, uh, some modifier factors uh, affecting these mutation. And in homozygous, in type two homozygous cases, 42% uh, of the mutation is this mutation. And in uh, type two cases, 40% of cases are, has this specific variant. Uh, this cis mutation can, cause type two disease. In this case, we can see double homozygous cases with type two disease. And if this variant is alone, not cis with this variant, then we can see a type three C cardiac Gaucher disease. And in the work, we do not see, we haven't seen any homozygous recombinant allele and uh, it might be related to perinatal lethal form. And please keep in mind that these recombinant alleles are highly important in Gaucher and we cannot uh, detect this variant with classical sequencing. Because of that, we must perform um, specific, we must perform specific genetic tests in order to detect recombinant allele. We can use MLPA or we can use uh, allow specific oligonucleotide technique in order to detect recombinant alleles in Gaucher disease. The, one of the interesting thing about Gaucher is heterozygous Gaucher carriers uh, are susceptible to Parkinson disease, especially the carriers of neuropathic Gaucher mutations are highly susceptible to uh, produce Parkinson disease and the risk is uh, sixfold higher than compared to the normal uh, healthy controls. And in this part, I want to talk about Fabry. It is also a sphingolipidosis. And Fabry is, the Fabry gene, GLA gene is located on X chromosome. It consists of seven exons. And this small gene has more than 1000 different variants. And we have, especially two clinical subtypes. First one is classical Fabry disease and the second one is variant Fabry disease. And we can reclassify variant Fabry into renal and cardiac uh, variant Fabry. And the, in the classical Fabry disease, uh, we have angiokeratoma, acroparesthesis, hypohydrosis or anhydrosis. And we have specific corneal um, formation named uh, cornea verticillata. We have left ventricle hypertrophy. We have stroke and end-stage renal disease in classical Fabry cases. And the residual enzyme activity is less than 1% in those cases. And the determinant of this residual enzyme activity is, of course, the mutation that we have in GLA gene. 
And in renal and the cardiac body and fiber disease, we are just seeing uh, left ventricle hypertrophy and end stage renal disease, and the residual enzyme activity is higher than 1%. And in the extreme disorders, we have hemizygous males, means that if uh, th these males have only one X chromosome and one GLA copy, and if we have mutation on the only uh, on the uh, chromosome that uh, this uh, patient has, we name this variant is as hemizygous. And this is a classical pedigree of extreme recessive inheritance. It is a classical pedigree of hemophilia A. It was thought that Fabry was um, inherited as extinct recessive, but after this paper, everything, is, everything was changed. This paper showed us that heterozygous uh, females are not just carriers. They, in most of the cases, they are, uh, are affected with Fabry. The numbers are really striking, as you see, uh, in nearly 60% of the carriers, uh, the, pay, uh, the female carriers has hypohydrosis, and in 80% eight, uh, of the cases, they had microalbuminuria, and EKG abnormalities uh, are seen in more than 75% of the cases, and nearly 25% of the cases have left ventricular hypertrophy. And interesting, this is the interesting table because uh, what we see here is the number of female patients are higher than the number of male cases. And another interesting figure here is the overall diagnostic delay is more than 20 years in February. And please keep in mind that these are preventable and treatable uh, metabolic disorders. And why we are seeing many female fabric cases? Uh, there are two group of uh, female fabric cases. In the first group, we have cases which has which have severe diseases like males, and the reasons uh, for this are affected father. If we have an affected father married with a carrier mother, we may have homozygous female cases. And in the Turner syndrome cases, they have only one X chromosome. And if there is a mutation on the uh, GLA gene on this single X chromosome, uh, she will have severe Fabry disease. And the last uh, reason is uniparental isodiazomy in, in which two X chromosome is coming from a single parent. But these two reasons are just responsible for 5% of all female Fabry cases. In the 95% of the cases, the problem is skewed X inactivation. X inactivation is a normal process um, in which it is trying to establish the genomic balance between male and females. And in normal, in, uh, normal females, it must be random, but in Fabry, we do not know the exact uh, pathology, but we are seeing a skewed X inactivation. This is a huge Chinese uh, cardiac variant Fabry family. As you see, there are many affected uh, female cases, even more than male cases. And what we see in the DNA sequencing is, this is um, hemizygous male and this is a heterozygous female. But what we see in RNA sequencing is, the mutated allele it was um, expressed um, more densely compared to the normal allele. And we can uh, detect this pathology with uh, X chromosomal inactivation analysis. As you see, the uh, mutant ex expression uh, is very high compared to the normal X expression. And the last disease is Pompe disease. Um, it is also an autosomal recessively inherited uh, lysosomal storage disease. The responsible gene is GAA gene. And there are 19 coding axons and totally 20 axons. And more than 700 uh, different mutations have been described up to now. And we have two uh, clinical subtypes here. One of them is infantile onset Pompe disease, and the other one is late onset Pompe disease. In the infantile onset Pompe disease, indeed, this is a genetic emergency. 
in infantile onset Tompe disease, we must give the genetic result of the patient in days because the uh, phenotype is so severe. There is a uh, huge muscle weakness in the patient and the residual enzyme activity is less than 1%. The patient has uh, feeding difficulties and failure to try and uh, motor delay and generalized muscle weakness. And the main problem is respiratory problems in these babies. But the fatal problem is, of course, the cardiac problems. The patient has cardiomegaly or cardiomyopathy. In the late onset Pompe cases, the uh, phenotype is subtle and GAA enzyme activity is between 2 to 40 percent. We do not have any apparent cardiac involvement in those cases, but the main um, main symptom is proximal muscular weakness. Due to this region, uh, due to this reason, um, it is uh, one of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies. And in, in order to diagnose these late onset Pompe cases, it is better to use a, a limb girdle muscular dystrophy panel in order to rapidly diagnose uh, late onset Pompe cases. In some cases, we might have respiratory insufficiency. We use sequencing and MLPA in the diagnosis of Pompe. Sequencing can diagnose nearly 90% um, of all cases. And in the remaining 10%, MLPA is, uh, we, we, we may detect limitations with MLPA. And we have a specific deletion here. Exon 8 and deletion is highly important in Pompe disease. In nearly 5% of the cases, we are seeing this specific uh, exonic deletion. And this is the most common Pompe mutation. This mutation can uh, cause um, juvenile onset or late onset Pompe disease. If you have one uh, classical late onset mutation, this variant, then uh, your patient will probably have juvenile onset Pompe disease. And how is genotype-phenotype correlation in Pompe disease? Um, Nonsense mutations, deletions and insertions in most cases cause infantile onset Pompe disease. And splicing and miscess variants can uh, either um, cause infantile onset or late onset Pompe disease. And this is our classical late onset Pompe mutation. Uh, it can be different presentations in homozygous cases. And um, nowadays we know that some uh, in GA genes, some modifier uh, genetic variants um, have been described. If you have these specific modifiers, then you will probably have more severe uh, phenotypes due to this variant. Uh, but we know that the overall uh, phenotype of this variant is late onset Pompe disease. The importance of these two uh, diseases uh, is these two forms of lysosomal storage disease are treatable and preventable uh, metabolic and lysosomal storage diseases. And the important point is in nearly all of lysosomal storage diseases, the overall diagnostic delay is uh, so high. And uh, because of that, early diagnosis, early genetic diagnosis uh, is highly important in lysosomal storage diseases. And this was my last slide. Thank you for your listening. And my last. Uh, point here is exon 18 deletion definitely caused infantile onset Pompe disease. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hussain, for such a great uh, overview. Um, let me just share my screen. All right, so before we move on to our second talk, uh, we'd like to show you a bit of uh, data we have on LSDs from our CTGA database. Now, if you're not familiar with uh, CTGA, it's a genetic database, open access, that uh, we at CAGS maintain. And it holds uh, disease, gene, and variant data uh, curated from the literature on Arab individuals. 
in a very short video, Sami Bizari from the CAGS team will show you, will showcase the data we have on LSDs uh, that have been reported in Emirati individuals that are on CTJ. Over to you, Sami. Hi everyone, as Stephanie mentioned, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to showcase the data that the CTGA database offers on lysosomal storage disorders. The database presents disease, gene, and variant data reported in anonymous Arab subjects, but for this snippet we will just focus on the Emirati data within CTGA. So with information derived from the literature, CTGA currently holds data on 48 LSDs belonging to multiple subtypes. 31 of these disorders have been described in the UAE in association with 27 genes. 43 variants and LSD-associated genes have been identified in UAE subjects. The data on variants on CDGA include descriptions on the type of mutation and zygosity status in the subject, as well as their presence on mainstream public databases such as dbSNP and ClinVar, with the clinical significance of the variants mainly obtained from ClinVar. CTGA additionally holds exclusive variant data and variant observations. For such variants, we report on the coordinates and clinical significance described specifically in the published reports. So to briefly showcase CTJ on the front end, here's an example of an interconnected disease and variant record for a subject diagnosed with alphamanocidosis. The disease entry presents an epidemiology table oriented around anonymous subjects. For a typical subject, a phenotypic description is provided using terms from the human phenotype ontology. The associated variant is shown using HGVS nomenclature, and additional details include zygosity and the mode of inheritance, along with a link to the reference from which the subject data was derived. The variant entry holds additional data on the variant, including chromosomal, genomic, and protein HGVS coordinates, as well as variant IDs for dbSNP and ClinVar, if available. The study-specific clinical significance and associated condition are also presented in a table in the record. Published studies on Arab subjects may provide additional unique observations associated with the variant, which we present here on CTGA. For example, a variant reported as benign on ClinVar was classified as likely pathogenic in a study reporting a subject with Schindler disease, homozygous for the same variant. So CTGA maintains such subject-specific data to provide the bigger picture. I hope this brief showcase provided an idea of what the database can offer. Please visit our database at cags.org.ae slash CTGA to access similar data on genetic disorders in the UAE and the rest of the Arab world. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sami. Um... I hope this uh, short video provided an example of the utility uh, of CTGA for clinicians and geneticists who are working on Emirati subjects as well as other uh, uh, Arab individuals. Um, and uh, for any of you who are working on uh, genetic data uh, from Arab individuals, uh, if you'd like to showcase your um, data on CTGA, we are happy to accept submissions. We will paste the link in the chat. And now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our second speaker for today, uh, Dr. Sorry again, Dr. Ahmed Al Faris. Uh, Dr. Ahmed completed his medical school training in Saudi. He then moved to Canada, where he did his uh, his uh, residency in Montreal University, uh, and then over to the US uh, at Harvard Medical School, where he completed two fellowships. He then came back to the region, and he is currently a, a senior consultant at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center, uh, where he is working in an NGS lab. Uh, his talk today will discuss the challenges um, that happened during variant analysis and interpretation during the uh, diagnostic journey. Dr. Ahmad, it's very nice to have you back in, uh, in another CAGS event and uh, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, and uh, thank you for the invitations and uh, I'm happy and glad to be part of this webinar. Uh, uh, I will be walking you through uh, variant analysis and interpretations of lysosomal storage disorder. Uh, Bear with me because the point of this talk is to show you the complexity of variant analysis and interpretations when we go dig deep into just one disease, for example. So uh, in general, we as a clinicians, when we try and assess any patients, we go with the history and physical examinations. We do our basic metabolic and genetic workup, and then maybe we try the debate, should we go with single gene? Should we go with the SGH if there's a deletion or a duplications? And then maybe we will wonder about exome sequencing because 
all these can all these molecular events can basically would lead to a disease. And then if all negative, we'll start, well, shall we do whole genome sequencing or no? Uh, and beside that, there is a significant pro proportion of the patients who undergo all these extensive genetic testing, including karyotype, RACGH, genomic hybridization, Sanger, MLPA, gene panel, and GS, and then they are still remain at diagnosis, and there are explanations for this. Now, the, the advantage of next generation sequencing technology try to solve and filling the gap of some challenging. It can, it, it were to provide the opportunity to test the entire exome for some individual. And then in our country or in our region, basically the reported diagnostic yield of an exome could be ranged from 20 to 25 to 35. There are some reports uh, up to 40, some claiming to 50% in trio analysis and et cetera. Uh, but then uh, we know that an exome sequencing would provide a higher yield compared to any other diagnostic modalities and the genetic testing. Now, the knowing this information and then knowing that the exome sequencing will provide a full screening for all of the genes, there are some specific information that is limited to our population that we can use and utilize during the analysis. For example, we know the majority of the disease-causing variants in our population are in the autosomal recessive and homozygous. And we use this information when we analyzing any variant. A homozygous variant that in an autosomal recessive disease is the bulk of the disease-causing variant in our population. And then we go down to autosomal dominant and then X-linked. We know majority of the autosomal storage disease, if not all, uh, are uh, except maybe there are a few with the X linked, a uh, majority will be an autosomal recessive diseases. So basically, we'll be looking for an autosomal variant in one of these genes that are uh, autosomal homozygous variant in one of these autosomal recessive genes. Now, uh, the, there is an advantage of using a database, and uh, we just heard uh, a nice video presentation about how these databases can be useful during the analysis. And when we came across any variant, we tried to do curations about all these variants and all the available databases and using different computational prediction tools, trying to score a variant. And then with this brief background, the ACMG came with a joint consensus and rec recommendations in how you classify each variant using all the information that you have about this gene and this variant. And then what they are, what we are trying here is this is the table from the ACMG paper that I'm sure majority of you or not all know about it. We classified the variant to very strong variant, a strong variant, then strong with, or then these are variants will be the likely pathogenic, then there is possibly moderate, then there is a benign variant. And then we use a scoring system to come up uh, with the classification of each variant. Again, the purpose of this talk is just to show you the complexity of classifying any variants in molecular laboratory. And now this is a general speaking about any variant that we came across in exome sequencing. I will choose one disease from the lysosomal storage disease that uh, <coughs> Professor Sen talked about it, Pompe disease. The reason why I choose that, well, Pompe disease is an acid alpha glucosidase which is the enzyme responsible for degradations for glycogen polymer. And then there is a step that where, when there is a failure on this degradation, then the glucose will be accumulated in the cardiac and skeletal muscle. And then there are subtypes. And then usually cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle are the major observed uh, system will be affected by this enzyme deficiency. And as we heard also from, the, from Professor and talk, there are fetal, there are also milder phenotype, but usually the fetal will die from respiratory insufficiency as the major cause. Now, the good news is that there is an enzyme replacement therapy for this Pompe disease that can help to elevate some of these manifestations. 
The, uh, in the left side, you see the pompate disease, and if there is a failure on the enzyme, then there will be an accumulations of the MPAC and the glycogen, which will affect the AMPK pathway that impacting the signal, signaling abnormalities, and then there will be an autophagy impairment. Autophagy. If there is, if with the, with the enzyme replacement therapy, basically we are trying to get out the, the glucose from the cells, and then the, all the pathway will be repaired and then the muscle will have an improved muscle function. Now, why I choose Bombay disease? Because it's a good example of the complexity of classifying a variance that occur in this fetal lethal disease where there, there is a treatment. There is a group called clinical domain working group or called ClinGen. And this is, is a funded group that they, their job is our main goal is to look at these lysosomal storage disorder. They create a panel, and this panel is focusing all their efforts to look at what are these criteria in the ACMG criteria domain that can be applied and used to classify just one single gene, for uh, the GAA. The, uh, the cleansing group was for the lysosomal storage disease that they will do curations. They were formed in 2018. It took them almost from 2018, February, up to August 2019 to have the final approval. So imagine just one disease. It took them almost a year and a half to come up with a conclusion and a guideline how you want to classify a variant. So don't expect from me in 20 minutes a variant in Pompe disease. So uh, it took them one and a half years to come up with these guidelines. Don't expect that in 20 minutes that we will go over all the possible chances uh, for Pompe disease to classify. here is to show you again is the complexity of such a per the idea is again to classify all these variants into one of the uh, ACMG. Now there are a few things that's very important about uh, Pompe disease. It's there is only one gene that is encoding. There is only one isoform so that's make the life easier little and we know that loss of function variants is a non-mechanism. So these are a fundamental information about the Pompe disease. Compared to, for example, a breast cancer, there are many genes that can cause breast cancer. And there are different isoforms for BRCA1, BRCA2. These are different layers of complexity that is not available in Pompe disease. Now, again, these are the molecular and it will show you how one disease is very complex sometimes to classify. The PSV1 is a pathogenic, very strong, that ACMG think this is a very strong variant that will really cause the disease and will match or can reach a, a classification of a pathogen. What are these variants? These variants are the, no, the null variants or a loss of function variants that will result in exon scaling, for example, a canonical, which is near the splice site, or that impacting the initiation codon. Now, if we see this variance based on the clungeon, based on the agreement, this is a PBS1. Two, if we have a variant that is well, it's a loss of function, but that it is occur at, again, in this gene, occur on the last exome, for example. There is a phenomenon in the molecular called nonsense mediated TK, means this protein could skip the nonsense mediated TK, and then instead of the resulting premature termination is in the last exome, which is exome 20, or in the last 50 base pair of the nucleotide, then exon, from exon 19, after this one specific codon, then maybe BBS1 might not be applied. So as a general speaking, if we have a stop codon, then PBS1, which will apply as a pathogenic variant. In this situation, when it is in exon 20 or in this 
exact position at the protein that at this nucleotide, at this codon, this stop codon or this stop variant may not apply here because there will be a phenomenon called nonsense mediated TK, and then this can skip the premature termination. Then the other thing is, so this is just one example of how just one disease are complex. Now, because these groups studied, the Clungeon studied this gene very well, we found that also there are, we know that in the, all the donor and acceptor splice site, func splice site, there's a rule. And this gene, GAA, follow the splicing site, acceptor, and donor. However, in the intron 19, again, that's intron 19, well, not, may not lead to the, may not lead to what is really happening. And then the, the fact that splice site variant may not apply in the last intron. In this case, this variant we may not be applied as a positive, very strong, and it will fit to positive strong, but not very strong. Next, if there is, now again, these are very specific features that apply to Pompeii disease. We know that any variant in the initiating codon by default is the first codon in the gene by default, we're always trying to classify this variant as a pathogenic because this has been observed before. Now, the next, if there is a mutation in this first codon, then the next initiation codon will be at position 122 instead of position 1. Then the likelihood that this start site will be at 122 can be, and then there will be a protein that will be will be formed, but the likelihood is low. And even if that likelihood, another initiation codon started, the gene product would be still missing an important signal sequence. And then that means there may be still an impact or effect of this gene or this variant on the gene product. Now, I will not go further in deep detail, but I will just go skim through other, all what Clungeon trying to come on one single gene. Now, for a deletion and duplications, if a single or a multiple exon deletion, which lost out of frame, then it is a loss of function, we are done, except again, this should not be happening in the last exon or 50 base pair from exon 19. If the deletion results on end frame, not out of frame, then it should be encompasses one or more exons, then this will apply. If the end frame deletion is similar to one, two, is smaller than one exon, then imagine this one exon, that end frame deletion, it may very strong, BBS1 may not apply, positive very strong, and we may use moderate criteria. For a duplication, if there is a single or multi exon duplication, this has never been reported before. And then there is a, a tree that they are used if this happens seen and if we see more than one exon duplication. Now that's at the molecular level. Uh, there is a deletion, duplication, missense. Where is the exact locations of this missense? It's very important information. Then there is another level of complexity. If you have a compound heterozygous variant, and this one, one variant is a pathogenic, but then we need to confirm if they are on cis or trans, and then there is a scoring system. If they are two pathogenic, you will confirm them. They Both of them, they are on cis and trans, then the scoring will be one. If the facing is unknown, then the scoring will be five, and this will be pathogenic. If they uh, that's for if they are homozygous occurrence, the maximum point. If you have points per propane, if you have more than one, you count how many individuals you have seen this variant. If you don't have the parents, because facing we need the parents, and then but you can calculate these points, and then and at the end of that I will show you. You, you come up with a calculating as a calculator to come up with the pathogenicity in the in Pompeii. Then. So <laughs> these are the descriptions of the evidence that we are using to calculate. 
Now, one, we use the impact of the variant. Two, we use psychosity. Three, we use functional. Here is a research paper. If a research paper that shows, for example, that this variant really demonstrating that the GAE activity will be low or less than 10%, then we give, for example, and it should be in leukocytes or lymphocytes or a muscle, and then it should be and all oh, less than 30% if it is in a cultured fibroplast. And then that and this activity is impaired and it's in appropriate tissue, we give scoring system. If we have this patient reported to have an infantile onset of Bombay disease, and then he has the symptoms, he has the manifestations, he has a cardiomegaly, and we it's reported as all full features of Pompeii disease, we give it one. If there is a cross-reactive, the, the CREM that we know that has been studied in the fibroblast, then there is a scoring system. So all this is basically collecting the evidence when you review this variant in, one, in the literature, trying to score this variant based on the functional analysis, if this variant is really causing the disease or no, and use with the For example, the PVS1 is a null variant, a nonsense variant, and in frame deletions, then all these will go very PVS1. If it is PM3, very strong, then we detect it in trans or cis, etc. And then the strong criteria, same amino acid. For example, there is an alanine to valine reported as a pathogenic, established pathogenic in paper, literature, etc. But now we're having a different variant at the same position. So it's alanine to tyrosine, for example, then this is, will be a strong variant. Uh, uh, if we have a variant that has established in vivo or in vitro functional. I will not go through all these criteria because it's too complex for only 20 minutes talk. But the Overall idea is to have strong, pathogenic strong, then we have a moderate criteria where the evidence is less strong compared to uh, the pathogenic, the established one. And then there are, we have also supporting criteria to support you that's maybe true or no, and mainly we are using sometimes the competitional tools. And then the easiest one is the benign one, if you see this variant common in the allele frequency, if you see this variant is homozygous and an affected individual, if you see this variant that is not segregating with the disease, there is no co-segregations, then all these variants, well, these, all these criteria, all tools will help you to classify this variant as a benign. Moving ahead, and I have two slides more. Then, uh, Dr. Abutayun has uh, published a paper about classifying the Pompe disease and summarized all the information in one slide or one paper. And we used all the calculations. And this one page will really help you to, or help us in the lab to reach a final conclusion about one variant and how we can classify it using all the evidence that has been adopted by ClinGen and also adopted by the American College of Medical Genetics, the ACMG guidelines. It combined this nonsense, the frame shift, if there is also splice site, if there is initiation codon, if there is a deletion, or if there's a duplications, and then you can just follow all these steps and then you reach that, you can, this can help you and guide you to classify the variant in, in a better way. Now, if this will be my last slide, and the point here is to show you the complexity. We know that we have 30,000, around 30,000 genes. We know there are around six, 7,000 OMM genes that has been characterized and linked to the phenotype. What I showed you is one gene of the 30,000 gene, how it's difficult to come up with a, class, a proper classification. An expert group took them one half, almost 18 months to come up, review all the literature, curate all the evidence to come up with better way for classification of only one gene. 
how this how, how what is is there any other alternative way for solving some similar problem and this is what i think is very important and that's maybe what most of presented about the database and is a sharing data if someone have done all the work and classified this variant as a pathogenic or likely pathogenic for example share this information sharing knowledge is something that is acceptable without we don't need to share a patient information we need to share the knowledge about the variant and this is more of an easy applicable way of solving maybe the complexity that for for classifying the variant i hope that what i did is i just uh, this is this is my last slide thank you so much uh, and i hope uh, that i was able to do, to demonstrate to you the complexity the difficulty for classifying the variants in just one gene where a variant happened before one stop codon could be pathogenic a variant happened after a variant happened before one exact codon could be pathogenic if it happened just one after that codon it will be benign maybe or unlikely to impact the disease and this is applied to only one disease among the all 30,000 30,000 gene that we have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, your, this was a great talk and complimented uh, really well uh, Dr. Hussain's talk. And thank you so much for touching upon the importance of uh, data sharing. Um, so now we can move over to um, answering some questions that we got from the attendees. I will try to go over them uh, one by one. Um, so I think this is uh, a question for you, Dr. Hussein, um, or actually to both. When do you recommend to use Sanger sequencing versus NGS, and when when is it necessary to perform L MLPA? Um, in the daily practice, we are always using NGS for sequencing. But as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, we use Sanger in order to perform rapid genetic testing and. We use mainly um, Sanger sequencing in, in, in the diagnosis of infantile, infantile onset pompy and uh, disorders such as uh, adenosine deaminase deficiency, especially in other deficiency. It is crucial to diagnose the patient in one or two days because the patient has this baby has limited time to survive. Uh, because of that, in those cases, we use Sanger sequencing. Uh, MLPA is a complementary method and in autosomal recessively inherited disorders, if we have one heterozygous variant in a, an, a, in a case uh, whose parents are not related to each other, second test can be MLPA because if parents are uh, consanguineous and if we do not find any causal mutation, in, we can detect indirectly the huge uh, deletions, but in order to detect huge duplications, we must perform MLP as a secondary test. In the Fabry, if we talk about an X-linked recessively inherited or X-linked inherited disorders, uh, in the female cases, uh, we may perform MLP. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to hear both your thoughts on this. Uh, in your experience, do LST patients of Middle Eastern or Arab origin carry different variants from the ones described in European populations? If so, what are the genotype-phenotype correlations seen with, with the Middle Eastern variants? Um, that just a small comment from my side. Uh, Dr. Ahmed will answer it better, I think. Um, especially on uh, MPS1, as I showed you in one slide, uh, different populations have different uh, mutational spectrum, but in the other um, three disorders, uh, especially in Gauche uh, and in Fabry and Pompey, mutation distribution are not changing to country to country, but uh, we know that some, we, have, we might have some uh, mutational hotspot in some specific populations. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, for our in our population, uh, unfortunately, we use the family name to know the variant sometimes. <laughs> so there are uh, unfortunately we use a family name as a uh, as a marker. Yeah. You uh, like a marker is a CPC, a marker is a blood test, a marker is a urine test. Uh, unfortunately, in our population, 
with a family name as a marker to know the exact variant. So uh, from that family, I know it's one variant. It's that one single variant that's causing this disease. Unfortunately, this is it's because of the consanguinity and the founder effect. So there are some specific mutation that is only present in our population, yes. All right. Um, the next question is, uh, to Dr. Hossein, you mentioned that heterozygous kosher carriers are susceptible to Parkinson's. Could you elaborate on this, please? Um, yes, um, this is an important issue, and it is, I think, it was first noticed that uh, 20 years ago, the, uh, the relationship between Parkinson's disease and the Gosha. And we know that the Gosha patients are uh, developing Parkinson's disease in the 10% of the Gosha patients, they will develop uh, Parkinson's disease by the age of 80. And this number is nimble, uh, this number is nearly the same for the carriers. And it must be about the lysosomal function. You know, in the Parkinson's disease, we have a, uh, a molecule which accumulates uh, in the nervous system. It is uh, cyniclane. And this might be related to the lysosomal malfunction. And due to this region, we do not the exact pathology, but uh, it was thought that uh, this two uh, accumulation is uh, interacting in this disorder. Because of that, it is uh, in, the number is so high in the 20% of all Gosha patients, there is one, especially uh, uh, one sign of Parkinsonism. Because of that, this high, uh, Parkinson um, susceptibility, it is recommended to screen uh, patients, Gosha patients, and especially uh, the carriers who has uh, who have carried the neuropathic Gosha mutation. Um, another question is about uh, modified genes for MPS and GAA. Uh, can you tell us how these genes affect the patient's phenotype? Yeah, uh, this is the, indeed that this is this was a general sentence. We know the importance of modifier factors, but we have just limited number of modifier factors in limited number of um, genetic disorders. For example, in beta thalassemia, it is the one of the most common genetic disorder in Turkey and in most of the countries. We know the exact modifier genes because we study it. Uh, beta thalassemia a lot, but in MPS1, it was just a hypothesis, but uh, two years ago uh, in uh, Pompey, it was um, uh, a modifier uh, variant was uh, detected in Pompey related to late onset Pompey cases. As I mentioned in my presentation, we have a very common intronic variant in Pompey, but in some homozygous cases, uh, we have infantile disorders, and in some um, homozygous cases, we have late on the disorders. And um, investigators found that at the end of exam two, we have a um, we have a synonymous variant. In the, this is a benign variant, but uh, the existence of this variant is determining the uh, age of uh, uh, de determining the uh, beginning of the disease at this patient. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ahmad, would you like to add anything? Um, oh, to uh, I, I completely agree with Dr. Hussein about this point. Modifier is always everywhere, and uh, we, we can have two different siblings have the same disease causing. Yeah. They have totally two different causes of disease because of this modifier, because what we think are modifiers. Uh, okay, uh, a question to you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, in case of a novel variant, how can a clinician go about applying these criteria to their variant in question to determine uh, pathogenicity? Well, again, it's, it's, it's exactly what the, uh, the complexity of this. It is a missense, lots of function variants, where it is located. Uh, it's that's, that's the bulk of the work in the molecular lab is trying to came up with a conclusion about this variant, trying to help the physician and the clinic. So we will do the hard lifting and you come up, it's a pathogenic variant and it, or we say it's a VOS and then you will be unhappy why we are reporting it as a VOS. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. It's, that's, that's the nature. It's an, 
we just apply the rules and the guidelines. Okay, I think we're gonna take uh, just one more question for each of you. Um, Dr. Hussain, what is the rate of mutation detection using Sanger sequencing in, in these tests? Okay, it is not easy to give an exact number and we do not separate Sanger sequencing or next generation sequencing. This is just sequencing the technology. But uh, what I can give a constant number from my um, experience is, I was uh, performing uh, 30,000 genetic tests annually in my lab. It, it's a governmental university hospital. And in every year, our diagnostic rate is similar. It is just 5% uh, in 30,000 genetic tests annually. All right, thank you. Um, the last question would be about data sharing. So this is for you, Dr. Ahmed. In your opinion, I guess, is it better to update existing variant databases like ClinVar and ClinGen or to share our own data, data sets? Well, well, that a lot of the uh, ethnic data sometimes is missing from the international databases. Go wow, ahead. that's so <laughs> there are two points to consider here. One is if you have a policy to share your data and other domains like Clambar and you are allowed, or you can share it or share it in your. So the, the reason why we need maybe using Clambar because software tools in the lab can automate the Clambar, pull it in an easy way and do the filtration. So uh, my life would be easier if you're variants in Clambar because most of the softwares can use Clambar and filter. If but if you are if you are not allowed and cannot do that, then share it even in your database. We uh, we have we published our. Uh, I used to work at National Guard, and all of our patients in the National Guard know the database is available. It's called KG. I can share the link in the chat. It's called KGD KMark, and we have more than one thousand whole genome. We are, we were unable to share this variant on Clamvar, unfortunately, because of logistics and policies and rules, but uh, please, uh, the, I will share the link uh, in, the, in the chat. You can register. Uh, we have more than, they, are, they have, I used to work there. So there are more than 1,000 whole genome Saudi and more than 2,000 exome Saudi clinically curated cases. I wish if these cases in Colombo are easier for filtrations, but because of rules and policies, we have them and we share them in our centers. Okay, so maybe we should uh, continue this conversation because it would be good also to, to have these in CTJ as well in some way. But anyways, yeah. good luck. <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, I think we're going to stop with the questions for now uh, because of the time. Um, I, before we conclude, I would like to just, um, sorry. Uh, thank you both very much for the great webinar, for the great talks, and for the nice discussion. Uh, and a big thank you to Sanofi for sponsoring this uh, webinar. Um, as I said, in a few minutes, there's uh, a survey that's going to pop on your screens. Please answer the questions. And your CME certificates will be, um, uh, we had some questions about this, so they will be ready as of tomorrow at the following link. Please follow this link and use the email that you registered with and you'll be able to get your certificate. Um, for those of you with an interest in uh, myology, CAGS is organizing the second Mina Mayo course in October. You can follow um, this, um, this link as well to know more about, uh, to know more details about the upcoming course. Thank you, Dr. Hussain. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, very nice to have you both. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. And have a good night. Thank, thank you so bye much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.